Okay, here we are. We're continuing our, it's our second class on memory of uh, the second class on the second text, the second volume of Galeano's trilogy, Memory of Fire. This one, of course, faces in masks from 1700 to 1900. So we're now past the colonial encounters, the terrible tales that we read in the volume Genesis of indigenous encounters with European colonizers. Um, we're now into, as we said last time, a culture that seems more itself over 200 years of cohabitation, if you want, among various cultures. Now this starts to look like Latin America, the Latin America that uh, we, we know and love today. Still, there are huge upheavals, and I thought I'd look at a couple. Um, now the upheavals are independence movements. They're the dictators that replace the viceroys and the uh, some of the not dictators. Some some, and it's not just Latin America, of course. I thought just for the fun of it, we'd start, and then I want to ask you to to point to texts that and passages that interest you. But I thought we'd start with the ones on Texas. Here we are, embodied in. Uh, this long history of the Americas by Galeano. The passage on Texas, if you'd go to 1835, you won't be surprised that it's 1835 because as we all know as good Texans, this is the time of the uh, independence movement of the Tejanos uh, from Mexico or the usurpation, if you want, by um, Anglo settlers who outsettled the Mexican settlers. Remember the map we saw, and it's still on your website, of the territory that was New Spain. It goes up to San Francisco. It's all of Colorado, not all of Colorado, some of Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, the areas of Texas. And in 1835, as we well know, Texas, or a few Tejanos, Texans, seceded from Mexico. Mexico never recognized that. As far as they were concerned, it was still Mexico. But in the US, we called it Texas, and we called it the Republic of Texas. And then the war breaks out. Look at 146, page 146. It's, it's so interesting to see what else is going on around these very same dates. If you notice the page before, we have Darwin in the Galapagos, Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador, as you know. So here's Darwin creating his theory of evolution at the same time that Sam Houston uh, and Austin and our other Texas heroes are um, seceding or usurping, if you want, uh, Mexican land. It depends, of course, on your liberating Mexican Texas from Mexico, depending on your, your perspective. Uh, at the time, there were plenty of perspect perspectives. So let's just look at a couple of these, and then we'll go to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, 1848, which finalizes the, I, I will say, usurpation, the unlegal, illegal overtaking of Mexican land by the US government. It was an annexation of, of Mexican land. We paid $15 million, as I recall. We'll get to that in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. In 1848, we paid $15 million, but we paid for land that wasn't for sale. It's not the same. If we were for sale at that price and we bought it, that was not the case. Let's just look at this Columbia, Texas. 1835, the top of page 146 in Faces and Masks. Fifteen years ago, a wagon train creaked across the desert prairie of Texas, and the mournful voices of owls and coyotes bid them ill, Ill come. Nice, instead of welcome. Forbidding, after all, owls and coyotes in this mournful voices. Mexico ceded land to these 300 families that came from Louisiana and their, with their slaves and plows. Five years ago, there were already 20,000 North American colonists in Texas, and they had many slaves purchased in Cuba or in the corrals where the gentry of Virginia and Kentucky fatten up little blacks. Now the colonists hoist their own flag, the image of a bear, and decline to pay taxes to the government of Mexico or to obey Mexican law, which has, abo had, has abolished slavery in all the national territory. That was one of the issues. 
Remember, slavery is abolished in Mexico, I believe, with independence in 1821. I'll have to check that. Does anybody know for sure? At the time of independence, slavery was, was canceled. It may be that it was earlier than that by Spain. I'll look into that. The vice president of the United States, John Calhoun, believes that God created blacks to cut wood, pick cotton, and carry water for the chosen people. Textile factories demand more cotton, and cotton demands more land and more blacks. There are powerful reasons, said Calhoun last year, for Texas to form part of the United States. At that time, President Jackson, who breathes frontiers with an athlete's lungs, has already sent his friend Sam Houston to Texas. The plans are in the making. The rugged Houston, that's Sam, forces his way in with his fists, makes himself an army general, and proclaims the independence of Texas. The new state, soon to be another star on the United States flag, has more land than France, and war breaks out against Mexico. It's perfect here against Mexico instead of with Mexico. I sort of expected to read with Mexico. War breaks out against Mexico. To declare, to declare that your, this territory is yours and not Mexico, you're going to have to go to war, and we'll see it in a minute when we get there. Let's just keep going. 1836, San Jacinto. The world grows, the, the free world grows. Ironic, ironic title, the free world grows. All of this usurpation of Mexican land is couched in let the world be free for democracy, for capitalism, etc. It's couched in the ideological terms of the US. The free world grows. And we know the irony because part of the reason the separation occurred is because slaves weren't allowed in Mexico. And this culture depended on slaves because it was cotton and cotton and more land. So already we see there are all sorts of, of ironies going on. Sam Houston offers land at four cents an acre. Battalions of North American volunteers pour in by every road and, vol and, we and weapons arrive by the shipload from New York and New Orleans. The comet that announced calamity in the skies over Mexico was no news to anybody. Mexico had lived in a perpetual state of calamity since the murders of Hidalgo and Morelos the murderers of Hidalgo and Morelos declared independence in order to grab the country for themselves. A reference to Mexico's failed independence movement. 1821, if independence is declared exactly 300 years after Cortes enters Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, but the first half of the, let's say 1821 to 1857 is a mess. Santa Ana, the famous fellow who loses, who wins at the Alamo, loses in, at the Battle of San Jacinto, which we'll see in a minute, was president of Mexico 11 times during that period. And altogether, his tenure as president was a couple of years or something like that. Governments changing like crazy. So poor Mexico, for the first 30 years of its independence, or 40, part of why we live in the US if we stand on Texas soil now, it, part of the disarray of independent Mexico allowed the usurpation of half of its territory by its energetic neighbor, neighbor to the north. So there are all sorts of weird things going on here. We've got Sam Houston raising battalions of North American volunteers. The comet that announced the calamity over the skies of Mexico. Hidalgo and Morelos were founding fathers of Mexico. They're murdered, etc. There's so much history here that we, we won't go. Let's just keep on reading. Bottom of 146. The war does not last long. Mexican General Santa Ana arrives calling for a bloodbath and makes one at the Alamo. But at San Jacinto loses 400 men in a quarter of an hour. Santa Ana gives up Texas in exchange for his own life and returns to Mexico City with his beaten army, his personal chef, his 7,000 dollar sword, his countless decorations, and his wagon load of co fighting cocks. General Houston celebrates his victory by naming himself president of Texas. Texas's constitution assures the master perpetual rights over his slaves as legitimately acquired property. Extend the area of liberty has been the slogan of the victorious troops. So that who's Who's liberating and whom, and who ends up unliberated? Well, there's plenty of irony there. But I, I like it very much that Galeano f 
focuses on the status of Texas as a slave territory at this point, a slave republic if you want, it enters as a slave state, it enters the Union. The Alamo, I know that you read it yourselves because I want to hear from you, but go if you will then to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, um, it's 18, the, the date is 1848, the page is 161. But let's start at the bottom of 160, 1847, Mexico City. By now, the U.S. has invaded Mexico, as you may remember. <laughs> um, that's the war against Mexico starts. We saw that in, in the last passage, 1835. Um, some of you will know a lot, the historians among you will know a lot about this. And I suppose if you've gone to high school in, well, I don't know how much, if you go to high school in, Houston or in Texas, do you learn a lot about the war with Mexico? In like the eighth grade, they don't teach you in high In eighth grade, yeah. After that, it becomes like the history starts in 1848. Is that about the way it goes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I bet maybe things are opening up a bit, but it's important to, th to realize that we only lately this was um, New Spain, this area, and then for a while, what? between 18, 1821 and 1835, it was Mexico. Um, and then, of course, it was the Texas Republic and so forth. Okay, let's look at the conquest, 1847, bottom of page 160. Mexico sparkles before our eyes. With these words, President Adams had dazzled himself at the turn of the century. I suppose that's the second John Adams president, turn of the century, because he would have been president at that time. So Mexico, Galeano suggesting, was always a little target, a little, it was in the back of the imperialist or the newly expanding United States of America, let's say. Um, at the first bite, Mexico lost Texas. We just saw that, 1835. Now the United States has all Mexico on its plate. General Santa Ana, master of retreat, flees to the south, leaving a trail of swords and corpses in the ditches. From defeat to defeat, he withdraws his army of bleeding, ill-fed, never-paid soldiers, and beside them the ancient cannons hauled by mules, and behind them a caravan of women carrying children, rags, and tortillas in a basket. The army of General Santa Ana, with more officers than soldiers, is only good for killing poor compatriots. In Chapultepec Castle in Mexico City, Mexican cadets, practically children, do not surrender. This is the invasion of the U.S. into Mexico City, landing in Veracruz, coming just as Cortes had, although some coming from the north as well, invade Mexico City. What's his name? Win Winfield Scott was head of all of that. He's portrayed in Diego Rivera's murals in the Palacio Nacional in Mexico City as some sort of distorted, horrible fellow. Anyway, there's the siege of the Chapultepec Castle, which was a military school. And there are six children who die. They do not surrender. They resist the bombardment with an obstinacy, obstinacy not born of hope. Stones collapse over their bodies. Among the stones, the victors plant the stars and stripes which rise from the smoke over the huge valley. The conquerors enter the capital. You see, he's making this sound just like it did when Cortes entered the valley uh, in 1521. The, the conquerors enter the capital, the city of Mexico, eight engineers, 2,000 monks, 2,500 lawyers, 20,000 beggars. The people huddle together, growl from the roof, it rains stones. Okay, the conquest there, the next is the conquerors, the conquistadores. Let's just go right on. 1848, Villa de Guadalupe Hidalgo. In Washington, President Polk, what's his first name again? James, James thank you. Thank you. One of the, um, one of those that slips one's mind. <laughs> Thank you. In Washington, President James Polk proclaims that his nation is now as big as all Europe. Yeah, U.S. is pretty pleased with all of this. No one can halt the onslaught of this young, voracious country. 
to the south and to the west of the United States grows, killing Indians, trampling on neighbors, or even paying. It bought Louisiana from Napoleon and now offers Spain $100 million for the island of Cuba. But the right of conquest is more glorious and cheaper. The treaty with Mexico is signed in the Villa de Guadalupe Hidalgo. Mexico cedes to the United States pistol at chest half of its territory. So from the Mexican point of view, there's a, a Museo de las Intervenciones. It's called Mu Museum in Mexico City, a fabulous museum. There are fabulous museums altogether in Mexico City called the Museum of the Interventions, which is a nice way of saying of the invasions. Indeed, it means Museum of the Invasions. Six times the U.S. has invaded Mexico. You learn all about this when you go to the museum or when you take a serious history course in Mexico. But also remember France had invaded and had, no, will invade Mexico in, um, let's see, 1861, I believe. There's a French emperor, Maximilian, for three years. He's ultimately killed by a firing squad, but Napoleon puts him there. So that Mexico, uh, to their great credit, wants the history of the country as a poor sort of basketball or, I don't know, straw straw man, I can't think of the right metaphor, someone who's been kicked around a bunch by its northern neighbors, by its Europeans, by the Spanish, um, and yet proud of that in a way too, proud of the resistance of, of the country and of the people. The next one down is about some Irishmen. We're not going to look at that. Um, I think we'll stop there, but I just wanted to, to focus on the, the Texas and the Mexico connection, since that's, after all, our little piece of this, this history. I don't think that Texas comes into it again, but I, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, but obviously this was the moment that would interest Galeano when the U.S. began, really, its history of domination of the hemisphere. So. Um, any comments or questions about that? I mean, we're, we're talking here about the history. We might talk about the literary presentation. It seems to me to be quite brilliant, for example, at the top of 161, when Galeano, the novelist or the fiction writer, wants to give you in one sentence the status of Mexico City's culture. He gives it to us with this list of numbers of people. That second paragraph, first full paragraph, top of 161, the city of Mexico, colon. Eight engineers, 2,000 monks, 2,500 2, lawyers, 20,000 beggars. You know, we can interpret that as we, we like, but I think what he's saying is that the educational level is not very high. The Catholic Church is a very, very important force still. The lawyers, well, you know, people complain certainly in the U.S. about too many lawyers. There's a curse, actually, in Spanish, que te, ve, let's see, how it? Que te encuentres entre abogados, or something like that. It's, it's something slightly different from that. Que te veas entre abogados. We hope to see you among lawyers. It means we hope that you have trouble. It's, it's, it's a curse. <laughs> So the, the, the prejudice against lawyers here and then the beggars, obviously. So, so from a literary point of view, how do you do that? You know, if you were a sociologist or a historian, you give pages and pages of, of data and description. Here he gives us a metaphor, really. Mexico City, four groups of people that tell us a great deal about the, the history. It's a wonder he doesn't. He does mention the thing about, or even paying, in the, the middle of the Guadalupe Hidalgo piece. He doesn't, he's not specific about the amount we paid or the fact that the land wasn't for sale. But people who want to defend, I, I actually had a student in class when we were looking at this in another context, who, people who want to defend the U.S.'s actions at this point say, well, we did pay for what we, what we took. Um, but, but that's not, it's not a justification. It takes this loss of half of Mexico's territory and what Octavio Paz says in the Labyrinth of Solitude, one of the unfairest wars of imperialism ever fought. He, um, it takes this loss for Mexico to shape up. Benito Juarez comes in as president. He says, no more Santanas, no more church, no more corruption. 
no more continuation of the old regime. A new constitution is put into effect in Mexico in 1857. Unfortunately, the French invade. So El Juarez, the president, goes to, guess where? Juarez, the city of Juarez, which is why it's now called that. And he has his government in exile, if you want, or in the north, while for three years, Maximilian and his wife, Carlota, reign in Mexico City. Eventually, there's a battle at Puebla. In fact, the Battle of the Cinco de Mayo is fought, and the French are displaced in something like 1567. I'm sure that that will come up here later. I didn't look for that in particular. But so the good news is sometimes the bad, the bad news sometimes is good news in the sense that this was an the northern part of what was independent Mexico, which became the south e southwestern part of the U.S., was an outpost of empire. It was thinly settled. The, the, the Democratic Republic of Mexico was, or the Republic of Mexico was in disarray, and so the U.S. took great advantage of the situation. Um, As a Mexicanophile myself, as a lover of Mexico, I somehow wish we were all in Mexico rather than the U.S. I don't know. The, the combination of cultures would, would have been nice. Um, but inevitably, in the U.S., there was, with our pluralist, accent, no, what am I saying, um, exclusive regime, we were going to take, take this territory and not let it remain very influenced by Mexico. We can say, well, San Antonio, well, parts of the border and so forth, but um, the U.S. isn't um, very good at incorporating. We're much better at imposing our own culture, Main Street. That's changing now with huge immigration issues, and there's more salsa sto sold in the U.S. than ketchup, I understand, so <laughs> who knows. Anyway, I wanted to point those out. Now let me ask you, who, who would be willing to give us their preference or tell us what you would like to point out. Anybody want to volunteer? Eli, did you, did you give us your example last time? Are you prepared to do that? Would you like to point to a, a passage that interests you in this text? Yeah, one that I found interesting, well, it kind of goes towards the end is the 1886, the Coca-Cola. 1886, okay. And make sure to speak into the microphone, please. Which one on 18, I'm sorry, 1886, wait, I'm not there yet. 18, I was going for the page number. Page 226, or is that where yes, we are? Yes, the bottom, Coca-Cola. Okay, the bottom on Coca-Cola, Atlanta. Oh, goody, I want to hear about this, yes. I remember this, yeah. Uh, do I read that? Would you please? Yeah, okay. it's just helpful. There's, because of the fragmented nature of this narrative, and because each one of these is a little poem, it's so finely tuned, paced, I think it's worth our reading it out loud. Yes, please. Okay. John Pemberton, pharmacist, has won some prestige for his love potions and baldness cures. Now he invents a medicine that relieves headaches and alleviates nausea. His new product is made from a base of cocoa leaves bought from the Andes and cola nuts, stimulated s stimulant seeds that come from Africa. Water, sugar, caramel, and certain secrets complete the formula. Soon Pemberton will sell his invention for $2,300. He is convinced that it is a good remedy, and he would burst with laughter, not with pride, if some fortune teller revealed to him that he had just created the symbol of the coming century. Very nice. Thank you so much for reminding us of this. Do you want to comment on it, Eli, or does it require commentary? I don't know. It's sort of like it just says it, it all. I love this idea of he created the symbol of the coming century, meaning, of course, the, the, the 20th. Coca-Cola, and the symbol of what? Of American know-how? Of American... Hmm? Commercialism, yeah, that's right. I think that's the better way to say it. Know-how, commercialism. Um, I keep trying not to use the word imperialism, but let's say um, globalization even. Mass culture, yeah, the whole thing. And yet I have to say, what would we do without Coca-Cola? <laughs> I really could get along without it, I think. <laughs> Other comments on it? Ashley, have you, have you, 
given us. Would you push the button, please? Thank you. Um, I liked an excerpt that's on page 175, the lines of the hand. 175, let us get there. 1852 Mendoza, Mendoza that one? Yes. yes. Okay, okay, good. Would you read it for us, um, please? Even the little altar, altar angels wear red sashes in Argentina to refuse challenges the fury of the dictator. Like many enemies of Rosas, Dr. Federico Mayor Arnold has suffered exile in prison. Not long ago, this young Buenos Aires professor published a book in Santiago de Chile. The book, adorned with French, English, and Latin quotations, began this way. Three cities have expelled me from their bosom, and four jails have received me to theirs. I have, I have however, thrown my thoughts freely in the, in the deposit's face. Despots. Des Despots. Despots. Face. Despots. Yes. Now again, I have launched my ideas into the world and await without fear what fate has in store for me. Two months later, on turning a corner, Dr. Federico Mayor Arnold falls in a spray of blood, but not by the order of the tyrant. Federico's mother-in-law, Don, Donna Maria, an ill-humored woman from Mendoza, has paid the knife-welding thugs. She has ordered them to kill her son-in-law because he does not please her. Nice. Comment on us. Comment for us what that. Why you chose that one, or why you like it. Don't forget to push the button, please. I just um, like the irony and the tragic, um, tra the tragedy of the story. Yeah. Just the yeah. Yeah, you think because of Rosas, we've already seen the dictator in in um, Chile. Is that right, or Argentina? Rather, dictator in Argentina. In fact, we have a whole list of dictators if we wanted to follow that thread in this particular volume. And yet the irony is that his mother-in-law does him in. What's fascinating, again, if we think about not only the story, but the way the story is told, in other words, the literariness of it, what I love about this is the way, and I th probably you too, is that kind of reverse ending, that punchline. You don't, ex or the reverse, let's say, last paragraph. We expect that somehow his his political. We're set up. In other words, we see that he's a, a dissident. He's been thrown out of three cities, and he's been in four jails. And yet, in the end, it's his mother-in-law who does him in. So it's a very, it's novelistic. You know, you could write a novel if you had to on that plot line. So thank you. That's very nice. Mendoza, of course, in Argentina. Yeah. Yes, Melissa, would you tell us yours? Mine is on page 44. Okay. And it's 1775 Guatemala City, Sacraments. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm not there. 45? 44. 44. Seventeen seventy. okay, Guatemala City, yes, tell us, Sacraments. Would you read it for us? As usual, yeah, thank you. The Indians only perform Easter rites if they coincide with days of rain, harvesting, or planting. The Archbishop of Guatemala, Pedro Cortes Larraz, issues a new decree warning that forgetfulness may imperil salvation of the soul. Nor do the Indians come to Mass. They do not respond to announcements or to the bell. They have to be sought out on horseback in villages and fields and dragged in by force. Absence is punished with eight lashes. But the mass offends the Mayan gods, and that has more power than fear of the thong. Fifty times a year, the mass interrupts work in the fields, the daily ceremony of communion with the earth. For the Indians, accompanying step by step, step by step the corn cycle of death and resurrection is a way of praying. And the earth, that immense temple, is their day-to-day -day testimony to the miracle of life being reborn. For them, all earth is a church all woods a mm -hmm. sanctuary. To escape the punishment of the pillory in the plaza, some Indians come to the confessional, where they learn to sin, and kneel before the altar, where they eat the guard of corn by way of communion. But they only bring their children to the baptismal font after having offered them, deep in the forest, to the old gods. Before them, they celebrate the joys of resurrection. All that is born is born again. Oh, very beautiful. Thank you. Well read. Yeah, comment on it for us, will you? Well, I like um, the language that Galeano uses it, how um, everything that the Indians do has a resonance to Catholicism. Like he says, they are in communion with the earth, mm -hmm. and they will come to Mass to take communion. That's mm -hmm. what the Catholics will call it. And then they do believe in, in resurrection, but for them it's, it's the way that corn is harvested. Um, mm -hmm. 
the Catholics believe in resurrection too. So it's a, it, he draws on the similarities, saying that you know really they mm -hmm. do have their own religion, and in fact they believe in many of the concepts, but it's a totally different tradition to them. And, and I am amazed and, and proud that the I guess the Guatemalan indigenous people still held on to their culture so much. Yeah. Yeah, and where are you from, Melissa? Where is your family from? From Mexico. From Mexico, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. This is a great example, and I'm so glad you chose it. It's the perfect example of syncretism, S-Y-N-C-R-E-T-I-S-M. It's not the same as, as synchronize your watches. That's the same time. Syncretism it means the same beliefs or a joining of beliefs where one culture's forms house another culture's belief system, and vice versa. The one set of symbols serves two sets of beliefs, or more than two in some cases. So this is, this is a great example of syncretism. I'm interested in this date in Guatemala City because the capital of Guatemala, I know, I think I mentioned I, have, I just went this summer to Guatemala, in fact, just before School started in part because my son got married in Antigua, Guatemala, which is great. He married a woman whose, part, uh, whose father is Guatemalan, and they thought that would be a nice place to go. And we said, great. We haven't been to Guatemala before, although I spent the last 30 years going much to Mexico. So it was interesting that somehow Guatemala hadn't called itself to my attention, or I just hadn't had the opportunity. So luckily, I discovered Guatemala this summer, and I want to recommend it super highly to you if you feel like uh, exploring a wonderful place. The Maya culture is so very alive there. Someone in Mexico said to me, well, going to Guatemala is, will be like going back 40 or 50 years in Mexico. It's a country that's less prosperous by far. It's a poor country still, but, it, but it, the indigenous populations are more present, let's say, less integrated, um, and especially in the small towns. But the date is what I'm going for here, um, 1775. Until 1773, Antigua, what's called Antigua de Guatemala, it means the former, it means the old, was the capital. In 1773, one too many earthquakes occurred, and the Spanish colonizers said, we're not going to rebuild. We're going to abandon this capital, and we're going to establish a new one, which is Guatemala City. So behind this business of making the Indians come to mass and dragging them from the fields by force, it's interesting to know that this is a brand new capital. It's a new, so, so, so it's still new in a way that um, informs, I think, Galeano's uh, narrative. Antigua was abandoned and it was basically quarantined because the cathedral was in ruins. There were, the, Antigua had ruled all of Central America. It was the outpost of New Spain in Central America, so it was a very important center. So there's, there were huge Dominican and Augustinian and Franciscan establishments there, monasteries, churches, and so forth. They were just left there. And brilliantly so, because when you go to Antigua now, you see the ruins. Lots of times they're shored up by modern arches or modern buttresses, but you see what it was without its being completely restored. So it's a fascinating. I think only of Venice, actually, as a city that's somehow caught in time in that way. So often in Latin America, as here, the old falls in f before the wheels of progress. But in Antigua, it, it simply was a city that was abandoned and left. And then in about 1942, some brilliant president, whose name I've forgotten, said, we're going to make this into a historic zone. We're going to allow no new construction. Any new construction has to be in the form of the old. So it's a very coherent colonial town. It's mainly a tourist town now in the sense that there hasn't been industry allowed in. There's, uh, and any industry or businesses that there are are so there's a gas station there, but there's no sign that says, you know, what, what the brand of gas is at all. Um, so it's, it's one of those wonderful and, and unusual examples where the past has been beautifully preserved by our um, modernizing culture. Other comments about this one that Melissa chose on Guatemala City? Thank you. I'm so glad you pointed that out to us. Let's see. Mr. Griffin, do you pronounce your first name Raun? How? 
Ron. Ah. Okay. Could, could you enlighten us? Do you have one that you'd like to, to point out and share with us your enthusiasm for or your knowledge of? Uh, well, I suppose I can comment on the one that we covered on Texas, page 146. Okay. Um, I won't dispute what Galliano has said, but it's interesting to me how he kind of left out, like prior to this, uh, there was a struggle between, I believe if my memory serves me correct, the centrist and the Federalist, and Santa Ana, I believe, was a Federalist. And the, uh, maybe one of the mistakes that the settlers of Stephen F. Austin made was uh, to side with the losing party. They sided with the centrist, I believe, and since Santa Ana prevailed, you know, there's auto automatically some bad blood there. Um, yeah, when did Santa Ana prevail? You see, you, ha you know more of Texas history than I do, so all my questions are innocent. I'd, I'd like to know more about this. I don't, I don't know about this. Um, when was that, this was going on in Texas territory, this battle between the centrist and the federalists, or in what in, is? In Mexico. In Mexico. Yes, okay. it, was, it was a struggle in Mexico. And then he sides, how does he side with either side? Because he hopes the centrists will allow him to? No, the settlers in Texas at that time, you know, I guess, you know, the lesson learned, if you're an expatriate, better stay neutral, you know, uh -huh. politically. But they did, and they sided with, I believe they sided with the centrists. And the centrist lost, and the Federalist won. And Santa Ana, I believe, was a Federalist, and that was kind of like the tension between. So Santa Ana said, I, "You're not ceding here. I'm going to send my troops up and beat you down." Right. It, it, there was there was automatically bad blood between them. Yeah. So uh, and it, it just to me, had they picked the right side, maybe had the settlers, you know, sided with the Federalists, there with wouldn't have been. The yeah. tension between the two. And what so. would have happened then? Yeah, exactly. Then they would have been an outpost of Mexico. They would have had to give up their slaves, of course. I'm not sure how it would have turned out, but I don't think it would have evolved the way that it did. Now, I'm not sure about Sam Houston. This is the first I've heard of this. But uh, as would far you, as... Would you do us the favor of looking into this for us? Because I would be interested. This is a very interesting hypothesis that there might have been some way that Texas would have remained part of Mexico. That is, that it wouldn't have felt that, that um, the, who, Calhoun, Jackson, all of the people that are mentioned here wouldn't have felt the need to, to usurp this territory. To me, I've always thought of it as rather inevitable that no matter who sided with whom in Mexico, that the U.S. was interested in annexing this territory. So I, I find your hypothesis very interesting. I, I, I've missed that one. Would you, would you look into that for sure. us? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Thank I you. guess my only evidence of, of the other would be that prior to this, there was no tension between uh, Mexicans and the settlers at Stephen F. Austin you know, had in Texas, so. Yeah, it's true that Mexico was just as happy, probably unwisely so, to have Anglo settlers. There was a point, though, where Mexico said no more Anglo settlers because they realized they were being outnumbered and they realized the imperializing or usurping intent of the, of the U.S., though, you know, there was that period of 14 years or 13 when Texas was independent. At that point, actually, independent Texas was contacted by the Yucatan that was trying to secede from Mexico as well and said, let's the two of us secede from Mexico, Texas, and the Yucatan, and let's, let's have an alliance. And there was this, there's this funny moment, and it may come up here with John Lloyd Stevens, where um, the Yucatan is interested in talking to Texas about providing a navy, which made me laugh when I first heard that, because we don't think of Texas as a, a naval power, uh, maybe oil, <laughs> but anyway, look into that for us, will you? Now, now tell me, let me continue to grill you, Ron, if I can. Um, did you have another passage that was interesting to you? Or, yes, or I you? did, but I had a question first concerning the first book, Genesis. Okay, please um, tell me. It seems to me like the main focus of the Spaniards was um, exploitation of the of the indigenous people and, and the land, and I'm puzzled as to why they they advocated and promoted with such tenacity the conversion to Catholicism. Because if if I believe correctly, didn't the Catholic Church at this time uh, uh, promote that the people of color didn't even have a soul? I mean, they weren't uh, they couldn't be saved anyway. So why 
was this huge emphasis placed on conversion. No, you're, you're wrong about that. There was a great deal of confusion when it was understood that America wasn't China and that there were people here in the Americas that were unaccounted for. So there were theories about who these people were and indeed discussion of whether they were real people or not. In terms of, let's just stick with the indigenous populations of America. There's a huge debate. And we saw that there's, a, there's an entry by about Las Casas, whom we saw, Berta, Bartolome de Las Casas, was one of early on arguing that, of course, these are people, of course, they have souls, and of course, we owe them the great favor of salvation. Um, a Spaniard named Sepulveda, and we didn't see that passage, and we should have in Genesis, um, argues a bit the contrary. He says, no, these, we can't be sure about these people, and so forth. Um, but very early on, it's this, oh, so one of the theories, for example, about who these people are and how it is possible that the Catholic Church has missed this, because there's also the problem of how the Catholic Church missed that the Americas exist. Remember, I told you that it take, Columbus dies abjuring the heresy, abjuring the heresy that he's found something new, because there can't be anything new. The Catholic Church doesn't know about that, and the Catholic Church knows everything. So it takes Amerigo Vespucci going down the coast of South America, and da, 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 da. we already went through that. So, um, so there's a bit of, there's a lot of confusion, just as when in the early 17, no, 1600s, early 17th century, Galileo says, no, the sun doesn't go around the earth, the earth, and the church goes, oh, no, this can't be, Galileo's in prison, but it, in a little while, people, even the church seeds that, yes, there is something new under the sun. So that's, so there is a, a lot of discourse about who these indigenous peoples are, but it takes no time at all for the Catholic Church to begin converting them. Indeed, we read that first passage when Cortes lands in Veracruz. Didn't we read that? And he says, I'm going to, no, I guess we didn't. The account of that, the true history of the conquest of New Spain, written by Bernal Diaz del Castillo, he says right away, Cortes told us to go up to the, to the pyramids and topple down the idols, and I'm going to implant the image of the Virgin. We talked about that, yeah. Um, so, so right away there was a sense that this was an audience for the Catholic Church. Now, your question is, with this intent to exploit, this intent to conquer, this search for El Dorado, this slave labor to which indigenous peoples were submitted without question, not to mention the plagues of smallpox and measles and everything, how, how can we say that the Catholics were at all interested in these souls? I assure you they were. And the reason they were is that if you're the one true church, you want to conquer everybody. For you, it's a justification for conquest. That's convenient. You know, why are we doing all this damage here? Well, these people need us. They need, they need to know about the one true, true God. So there's this true believer thing that you could say, well, it's just they didn't really care about those people's souls, but they needed to salve their own conscience by saying, well, I'm doing good for them, even though at the same time they're dying like flies of measles or whatever, or of overwork. But it is very important to understand, these are medieval men, they, they deeply believe on some level that they're doing God's work, that this is necessary. I mean, we can say some are better than others, but the Franciscans that came, the Augustinians, all of the, the Jesuits, all of the Carmelites, all of the colonizing orders, deeply believed that they were doing the right thing. And we can say now, but with a position of hindsight, we see that there was so much damage done that you can hardly overbalance the, the good work that might have been done. But that's easy for us to say. So I guess what I have to do is try to persuade you, not that these were good men in any modern sense, or good women for that matter, because also um, nuns were involved in the efforts of conversion. I mean, nuns came to Mexico and so forth. But if you are the Catholic Church, you have the obligation to convert. You have the obligation to try to make the whole world Catholic. And especially at this time, under the Habsburg kings, what were they doing? They were fighting against the Turks. You know, the Battle of Lepanto, where 
Cervantes loses his arms, 1573. They hold off the Turks and push them back. There's great celebration. You know, but there's under Charles V and Philip II, there's a deep-seated belief that the world must be Catholic and that Spain is the leader in that huge battle. It's why in 100 years, the Habsburgs bankrupted Spain even taking out the wealth out of the new world that they were taking out of. You can't fight battles on every front. They were fighting in the, in the, the um, Netherlands as well. You know, huge religious battle against the Protestants who are wanting to make Holland a republic and a Protestant republic. Well, the Dutch won in that case. So does that, does that what we have to do is hold, I think, terrible contradictions in our mind and just say, look, you know, some of the motives were pure, some of the motives weren't, and, but the Catholic Church, my line is the conquest was justified by conversion. That's the way I like to put it. And it can be justified in the positive sense, saying, oh, yes, well, some people really believed they were doing good by these people. And in another sense, you could say, well, it justified their exploitation. Does that make any sense at all? It's one of those contradictory things. And you may come down on the side, finally, that you know, all this discourse went on in, in 1992, the quincentenary of 1492. And you guys maybe are too young to remember that. But there's a huge debate in Mexico. Julie, I'm going to ask you to put your hand down. Thank you. Um, there was a huge debate in Mexico about whether there would be government money spent celebrating the conquest of Mexico. It was decided there would not be. That it, Mexico was not going to honor something that was bad was a bad thing. Carlos Fuentes says, well, you can say that, that's an interesting ideological position, but modern Mexico is born of that encounter of cultures, that encounter of peoples, and are we going to deny our own existence? So there are lots of positions to take. It's a very interesting debate. When you read Fuentes, as you will, uh, the, next, the next book up after Galeano, or the next writer, he, he talks about this, and it's a debate for Mexicans. You know, and, and a, a great deal was lost. A great deal was lost. But does that mean that modern Mexico is, or modern, I don't know, Peru, or mo most, of, most of Latin America is born of the encounter of various peoples? Does that mean we're, we're going to dismiss that as, as a historical fact. No, we can't. So you're right to ask about motives. I think motives are very important, and we have to try to put ourselves into the mindset of the people of the time and, and ask that question. And so the Catholic Church is both terribly culpable and terribly predictable, if you have the ideology they have. But then would you want to ask Ron the same question about Protestant behavior in the north at all does that strike you as relevant to this discussion yes to this absolutely. Uh, monologue that i just gave you <laughs> yes it does yeah um i guess to be more specific uh am i wrong about the catholic church's position with regards to uh indigenous people or people of color I you're absolutely wrong you're okay. absolutely wrong i could have sworn that i read what do you think all those catholic missionaries are doing in africa i know no, I'm talking about early pri prior on. to this, yeah. I thought Very that the Pope issued... Very early on, there's a debate about whether these are people or not. Very early on. But it doesn't take, it doesn't take but a... Cortes conquers Mexico City in 1521. 1524, the Franciscans arrive. He writes right back home and says, send me priests. And he says, send me reformed priests. I don't want the kind that are, I want the kind that go around barefoot and wear, <laughs> wear poor clothes. He says, I want the reformed orders. 1531, the Augustinians come. So they're not coming because they don't think these are people that need salvation. So, so there are debates. The Sepulveda... I'll try to get you some specific references on your question, but let's say this. There, there's wonder at the outset that there are whole populations that are unknown to the Catholic Church, but once it's, it's a matter of a very short a time before, before these are considered to be souls, considered to be souls that must be saved, which justifies the conquest. So, so let's say, um, 
let's say you, you may be right for a very short amount of time while these theories, oh, one, these must be the lost tribes of Israel, that one tribe, a certain tribe had gone to the east and so forth. They try to find sources in the Bible to explain who these people are. But it doesn't, that, that doesn't last very long, momentarily. And partly, if we want to be very cynical, we can say they needed these people for labor. They had every intention of exploiting the wealth that they immediately found. And, I mean, we read about Pedro de Alvarado. Cortes sends his cruelest lieutenant to Guatemala. 1523, two years, go on south, keep on going, conquer this land. I want all of this, you know. Um, and you need, you need help with that, you need labor. So it's handy to consider these people, handy to put the controls, the social and moral controls on these people. So, so it's a great question, but in terms of, of it, the idea that these aren't people lasting more than a half second, it just didn't. But look up in Genesis, will you? Look up again Las Casas, Bartolomé de Las Casas, and look up Sepúlveda. Sepúlveda is the one in Spain's arguing with Bartolomé. No, you know, they're not really people. So, so there is that debate. But with the Catholic Church, it doesn't last long at all. Anybody want to add to that? Julie, you had your hand up a while ago. Um, <clears throat> I was just going to mention the, that there was speculation at first that the natives could have been the lost tribes of Israel yeah. and or, you know, the people abandoned by God. But um, they were definitely viewed as savage, uncivilized people oh, sure. because they didn't have... But once have they got to be Catholicized, then they were less uncivilized. So that, that civilization issue and conversion issue are the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, they, I think they, um, there were various motives, regardless of whether they were right or wrong, there were various motives for... Um, conquering the Americas and exploiting the people that were there and also the, it was Los Reinos Católicos who were the first funders or who funded the um, sure. explorations there and so they wanted to claim that territory for the Catholic Church and all the resources that they were taking, all the gold and the silver, mm. it was justified to um, to enslave these unconverted peoples for the benefit of the Catholic Church. So... Yeah, slaves had been held. The word slave comes from eslavo. It comes from Slavic peoples. There, were sla there had been slaves since ancient times. So enslaving human beings, it, it wasn't something that was invented uh, in the Middle Ages. Or uh, So, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, there are plenty of motives, mainly wealth, let's say, but also very mainly as well, the, the Catholic notion that all peoples must hear the word of God and be saved. So, yeah. Okay, did you now, Ron, back to you one more time. Did you want to point out other than these things, or did you have another huge question, <laughs> or are you done? Would you push your button in any case? <laughs> Whatever the answer, any of the above, let uh, us hear you. I had another one. I didn't want to take up the whole class period. but Well, that's okay. We, we have enough time. <laughs> um, in the sense that, does anybody, would anyone else like to take Ron's time right now? I don't think there's too much competition for the, for the microphone. So everybody will talk sooner or later. Don't worry. Please go ahead. What page? Okay, lucky me. Page 11. Page 11. 1712, Santa Marta. Okay. We're in Colombia, or what is now Colombia, what was then Nueva Granada. Okay, tell us. Read it for us, will you? From piracy to contraband? Yes, from piracy to contraband. From the green foothills of the Sierra Nevada, which wets its feet in the sea, rises a bell tower surrounded by houses of wood and straw. In them lived the 30 white families of the port of Santa Marta. All around, in huts of reed and mud, sheltered by palm leaves, lived the Indians, blacks, and mixtures whom no one has bothered to count. 
Pirates have always been the nightmare of these coasts. Fifteen years ago, the Bishop of Santa Marta had to take apart the organ of the church to improvise ammunition. A week ago, English ships penetrated the cannon fire of forts guarding the bay and calmly met the dawn on the beach. Everybody fled into the hills. The pirates waited. They didn't steal so much as a handkerchief or burn a single house. Mistrustful, the inhabitants approached one by one, and Santa Marta has now become a pleasant market. The pirates, armed to the teeth, have come to buy and sell. They bargain, but are scrupulous in paying. Far away, over there, British workshops are growing and need markets. Many pirates are becoming contrabandists, although not one of them knows what the devil capital accumulation means. Oh yeah, that's very nice. Comment on it for us, will you? What, what attracted you to it, how it, how it operates as a, a passage? Uh, well, basically, in a nutshell, I'm a, I'm a history major, and Dr. O'Brien has a very interesting course on pirates and it's, it's interesting to note that something you may never have uh, considered is that the settlements around the Caribbean and the New World, uh, if it weren't for piracy, they wouldn't have been able to basically survive because it was the pirates who provided them with what they really needed in order to get started and move forward and kind of build up their communities and civilizations. So it's kind of a, you know, another twist on piracy. Yeah, thank you so much. That's exactly, it really is what this devil capital accumulation means. But they're, they're comerciantes, they're, they're um, businessmen, these pirates. They're, they're, they're traders, they're, they're selling and buying. And of course, what we expect, again, it's another one of those nice little plot twists that Galeano is capable of doing. We expect to hear that somehow the people flee, and then when they get back, all their stuff has been loaded onto the, to the ships. But no, the, the, the contrabandistas. The, uh, the, the smugglers, if you want, contrabanda, is um, they're waiting there nicely to, to buy and sell. And they're scrupulous about paying. Very, very nice. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Um, remember, we mentioned we, when we were looking, I believe, at our map where Cartagena is, that Cartagena, Barranquilla, and Santa Marta. Remember how there's Panama, and then there's South America. And Colombia has a Pacific coast and a Caribbean coast, right? Except I should be doing it like this. <laughs> In any case, uh, Santa Marta is still right where it was then, on, absolutely on the coast, as are Barranquilla and, and Cartagena. Cartagena became the great import place. We saw it last time uh, for, for South America. It's, it was easily accessible. You just take your ships from Africa with slaves, for example, or from Spain that want to load up stuff and uh, Cartagena becomes the primary port. Santa Marta is about an hour and a half, off. let's see, northeast. The, co the coast goes up a bit, but say east from, from Cartagena. Not a walled city, but Cartagena is super walled. You huge ramparts to protect against piracy, but piracy in the way we usually think of it. Guys running in and then taking stuff out. Thank you, that's very nice, Ron. I appreciate that. Okay, who else wants to do this? We still have some time. Yes, ma'am, would you tell me your name? Stephanie. Cindy? No, Stephanie. Stephanie. Yeah, sorry. What's your last name, Stephanie? I'm trying to it's figure Sanko, out. It's Sanko, S-A-N-K-O. Thank you very much, I've got you. Thank you. What page are we to turn to? Page 221, it's called You Too Can Succeed in Life. Okay. Two twenty-one, and which one is it? You too can succeed in life. Okay, great. Would you read it, please? The happiness road no longer leads only to the prairies of the West. Now it also, now it is also the day of the big cities. The whistle of the train, magic flute, awakens youth from its rustic drowsiness and invites it to join the new paradise of cement and steel. Any ragged orphan promised the siren voices can become a prosperous businessman if he works hard and lives virtuously in the offices and factories of the giant buildings. A writer, Horatio Algier, sells these illusions by the millions of copies. Algier is more famous than Shakespeare and his novels have a bigger circulation than the Bible. 
His readers and his characters, tame wage earners, have not stopped running since they got off the trains or transatlantic ships. In reality, the track is reserved for a handful of business athletes. But North American society massively consumes the fantasy of free competition and even cripples dream of winning races. Very nice, yeah, thank you. Would you comment on it for us, please? Um, looking back at the title, it kind of reminds me of like a slogan, the you too can succeed in life. And I think that also has to do with um, Galliano's view uh -huh. um, he, I think he takes the American motto of that time and kind of proves it false and misleading, which is um, what makes this passage jump out to me because um, in most history texts growing up, like in elementary school and stuff, they don't tell you that. They, they tell you, no, this was true for the time. Mm -hmm. But in reality, um, people were... Uh, People were trapped by their wages. They were they earned just enough to get by, but never enough to break out of like their social class. And I, this is why I like the passage so much. And um, he seems he, the first um, passage or the first paragraph, uh, it seems kind of sarcastic, like paradise is a cement and still you don't think of paradise like that. That's why I like the passage. Yeah, paradise is a cement and steel. Yes, it, you. It, one thing about Galliano, he doesn't um, pull any punches. That is, we know, we can s tell where he stands if we read carefully or not even so carefully, yes. But at the end, you're absolutely right. He totally de debunks this myth of Horatio Alger. Horatio Alger was an author who wrote about young you know, boys who start shining shoes and end up at the top of some heap, whether a, a big corporation or whatever. And so the Horatio Alger myth, we actually use that phrase to mean exactly the myth that's being described here. And this time myth I use, yeah, it's, it's a story we tell ourselves to know who we are, but sometimes myths are false advertising, yeah, or deceptive, yes, yeah. Other comments about that, Stephanie? Have you ever read Horatio Alger, or do you have you heard of him? Yeah. No, I haven't. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've never read him either. I, I just know the phrase, and I know that he was an author that wrote about these rags to riches kids, really young men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's just perfect. That last sentence is so nice. In reality, the track is reserved for a handful of business athletes. But North American society massively consumes the fantasy of free competition, and even cripples dream and even cripples dream of winning races. Now we might want to say, wait a minute here. There's not, there's, there is a reason why we're number one, we in the U.S. And that's because free competition is a great thing, and we're a meritocracy. And how dare you say that some of this isn't true? I mean. I'm not sure I want to leap to the defense of free competition, but what we see about Galliano is he's not allowing us to just swallow it whole. The fantasy of free competition is what he's saying. So, so thank you. That's a very, very useful passage. Thank you for pointing that out. Anybody else want to do this? Let's see. Who hasn't? Lisa, you do it. Tell us. You have to point. You have to push your button. Just one of those things in this class. I, beg your I just pardon. could add something on the the idea of the deceptive uh, comment. There, there was a section of page um, 128, the top of the page. It starts really in, on 127. That it, the last line is what I thought was was funny, and I, it was the same type of a passage that I, I marked from from Genesis. I, I do you want to just present the whole thing, or do you want to go straight to the end? I think end? I'll just go to the to the point, because I just okay, want to make fine, a quick that's point. Fine. And it's just the last paragraph. Um, Jose Mariano Ruiloba, a monk with a g great gift for oratory, a, mo a mouth full of gold, has prepared a splendid welcoming speech. But fate decrees that Ruiloba shall die before Bolivar can hear it. The speech is composed in Greek. And, and there was a passage in Genesis that I loved also where they um, made a proclamation to um, they made a proclamation to the Indians and they were defeated in a battle. It was uh, oh, right and then they and they then they said the in the future this proclamation will be made in the dead of night 
it's on page 60 in the Genesis text. It says, subsequently, the long speech will be read at dead of night without an interpreter and a half a league away from villages that will be taken by surprise. The natives asleep won't hear the words and declare them guilty of the crime committed against them. I just, that mm -hmm. theme of, of deception. So of obfuscation, of deception, of um, false advertising. Was that you who said that? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Page 60. Yeah, page 60 that was a, uh, is a great one, yes. I guess I should have told you to drag both books to class because one wants to go backward and uh, two, but take a look at that. And indeed, I will give you a list of passages in all, of the, in all three books which I consider to be essential. I mean, I think the whole thing, but I eventually I, I want to make sure that we are all focusing at least on a few of them together. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a, a very interesting one. Okay, anybody else willing to? Billy, thank you. Which, which um, one? It's uh, page 242. Okay. Um, disguises. 42. Hang on. There we go. 1896. Porter Prince. Disguises. Disguises. Right. Is that what yeah. you said? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Short little paragraph. It's horrible. I, you have to yell. Okay. Okay. Um, Please read it. According to the Constitution of Haiti, the Republic of Free Blacks speaks French and professes the Christian religion. The doctors are mortified because, despite laws and punishments. Creole continues as a language of nearly all Haitians, and nearly all continue believing in the voodoo gods who wander at large through woods and bodies. The government demands that peasants publicly swear an oath. I swear to destroy all fetishes and objects of superstition if I carry them with me or have them in my house or on my land. I swear never to lower myself to any superstitious practice. Okay, what, what would you like to point out about that one? No matter who the people are or who's in charge, I don't know if it's necessarily a power corrupts or if it's just a religion as the common denominator or what, but now you have like, you know, escape blacks and slaves and try to establish their own community and then country. And then they're doing the same things that they're oppressing their own people the same way that they were oppressed in the first place. Yeah, yeah. What what year is Haitian independence? Is, is it 1892 or so? The first republic, the first republic in the Americas to gain its independence. But we know, and some of you who've who've read uh, Alejo Carpentier's novel, The Kingdom of This World, know exactly what Billy was talking about. And if you studied Haiti, you know it. That. Um, and it, it's a bit what happens in Mexico after 1821 too. Um, it's not, they don't make as clean a getaway from the, found, from the uh, colonial oppressors as we did, we the US. Haiti then labors under um, bad government. But I thought maybe you'd chose, chosen this because it, it coincides so nicely with what Melissa read about Guatemala, that there's this attempt to impose modernity, Christianity, Catholicism? Well, that's, that's what I was saying, but yeah. I, I didn't want to speculate as to why it happens, just that it happens, and they tried to get away from it, and they wound up doing it themselves also. Yeah. Oh, and speculate. Why not? <laughs> well, why, I, why? I mean, why is it in Mexico that it, there's independence from Spain, in 1821 and 1823, one of the guys who got independence named Agustin de Iturbide crowns himself emperor. Why, why? Somebody who's fought for what seems to be a democratic system and then he doesn't last long as emperor, but why does power corrupt, in other words? Well, that's, that's what I was saying. It's, yeah. It's yeah. Power corrupts, and there's also the common denominator, common denominator of religion, and if you're a, if okay, if I was gonna be a king, I'd want a organized religion. It helps. It helps just yeah. to control it the masses, and control. that's and the only yeah. one at the time. Basically, yeah. is you know, Catholicism, especially with, or that's the only one there was when they started. Like there wasn't you know Lutheran or anything like that. 
at the time. They do in 1896 or whatever, yeah. but when they first started, when Spain first started conquering, there wasn't. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I beg your pardon. I interrupted you. <laughs> There's really nothing for, more for me to add. I don't. Okay, anybody wants to say anything? Fine. Does anybody want to add to the to the Haiti discussion? Yes, ma'am. Would you push the button, please? It, I don't know if it's the case in Guatemala, but uh, in Haiti, if you denounced uh, voodoo and those practices, that was a way of getting money. That was the way that you, that's how they separated their social classes. If you denounced that and did join the organized religion, you, that was a way of being the class, like the upper class. Yeah, joining the rulers. That's joining just the basically ruling class. Yeah. what mm -hmm. it was. I know because I'm Creole. Not, my family's not from Haiti, actually. We're from Cuba. Well, like generations back, not recently, obviously, because I have no accent. But uh, yeah, you do. I, you have a beautiful accent. It's a Texan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's Texan. <laughs> but that was a way of getting money, basically, if you just denounced all those practices and went along with yeah, yeah, the upper class. Yeah, it's somehow the past is anathema or something. I mean, in the history of the Americas, instead of saving what's there and saying, Maybe we could work with that. The idea is, no, now the new regime doesn't need the old regime, whether it's religion or whether it's government. But do, if you're at all interested in, in Haiti, there's so much done on it because Haiti became a huge worry for the U.S. The Haitian slaves, even though the government was a mess, as you pointed out, after the, um, the, the independence movement, Slaves were freed there first. It takes the U.S. until 1865. So Haiti becomes a huge nightmare for the U.S. What happens if there are slave rebellions? And what happens if the Haitians foment uh, unhappiness among slaves? So there's been a lot of study of the, the Haitian, um, Haiti, Haiti's relationship to the U.S. in the first half of the, the 19th century. And then there's this great novel, which I teach in my magical realism class, called The Kingdom of This World by Alejo Carpentier, a Cuban. But it's set in, in the novel is set in, in Haiti during the time of the revolution. And you learn tons about Haitian um, Haiti at that moment, because the French are there trying to impose a, a, a French rule, and then they're over overthrown and then we have more problems. So I'm glad you raised Haiti. Thank you, Billy. That was useful. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Yeah, Melissa, or are you going to make a comment? That's we maybe just have a time for comment. Yeah. I just wanted to comment how history in that way repeats itself. You know, we see it first with Guatemala and with Haiti. And in my opinion it's that same obsession with oaths and swears is still going on. I mean to become as citizen in this country, you still have to public, publicly not renounce to your religion or anything drastic like that, but make an oath and you know renounce to your other nationality and pledge allegiance to a flag and mm -hmm. sign the Patriot Act and all all these things that that will empower you to have more status in society yeah. or you know yeah it's and just very course, interesting. Part of what you could say, everything you've said is certainly true of us. Although you, there are people who don't have to renounce, including Mexicans who don't have to, if you become a U.S. citizen, now you don't have to renounce your Mexican citizenship, but at least in Mexico. You can maintain the both, both. In Mexico, but not in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. But the point is you can become a U.S. citizen without renouncing your Mexican, since about five, six years ago. To yeah, Mexico, you, though, not to the U.S. Yeah, but, <laughs> but the U.S. has to be complicit in some ways, or they would say, look, we're not giving you U.S. citizenship unless you renounce your Mexican. And so that has changed. Not that I don't totally agree that we're, we're exceedingly... What I guess I was going to say is part of what you're saying is it's, it's a product of a nationalistic system. That is, that we're a whole bunch of nations... That's why the European community is so interesting. Now with the euro, now you can cross, there's a free movement of labor in uh, 27 countries. That, I mean, France is still going to be France, and Germany is still going to be Germany, and England is still going to be England, but they've really gotten rid of a lot of the kind of thing that you're signaling. And it's very admirable. My husband, who teaches in the law school, likes to, and he teaches a course on NAFTA, um, he likes to say that by 2020, there's going to be free movement, free movement of peoples in North America because it's going to be useful for everyone. I keep saying we can't even pass an immigration bill. How do you think that maybe that's, that'll be the, the solution is that 
that national borders are becoming more permeable, except for our southern border, which is becoming more less and less permeable as we talk about walls and all sorts of things. So the U.S. is going definitely against the grain of transcending nationalism by making, I mean, we move more easily now. We should move more easily, but the U.S. has is, is got the barriers up. So I'm afraid that's a bit our, our terrible nationalistic policy. I'd vote against it. <laughs> I do vote against it. Yeah. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's call it quits. Please get a good start uh, for Tuesday on Century of Wind, the third volume of the trilogy. Thank you for your participation.